Greetings to all of you who are gathered for worship on this Sunday when we remember Mary of Magdalene. Don't hold on to me. Go to your brothers. Don't hold on to me. Go to your brothers. All week long, I have been sitting with this sentence. It's been speaking to me all week long because this sentence reflects a tension that I feel in myself and that I can also see in others. On the one hand, we want to hold on to what is familiar, what is comfortable. But on the other hand, we are being pushed into a new and unfamiliar future. Of course, Mary Magdalene wanted to hold on to Jesus. How could she not? Here she was on Easter morning, grieving, blind with grief, heartbroken, so sad, everything hurt so much. And then suddenly there was Jesus and he was alive and she can't believe it at first. It's too good to be true. And now things can go back to normal, back to the way they used to be before that horrible night in Gethsemane when the soldiers came and arrested him and brought him before Pilate and then he was crucified and then he died on the cross. But now things can go back to normal because thank goodness Jesus has miraculously come back to life. Now they can share meals again and listen to his teachings again and walk with him and watch him heal the sick and bless the children and argue with his opponents. They can once again walk on the shore of Galilee and hear him preach in parables and get inspired about his vision of the kingdom. They can sing in the fields as the evening sun is setting and travel through the countryside. They can in, together enjoy the splendor of God's beautiful creation. It was so wonderful to have Jesus back. But Jesus was not coming back. He was moving forward, forward to the next chapter that needed to happen for the healing of the world. And Mary Magdalene, likewise, needed to move forward. Do not hold on to me, Jesus said. Go, go to your brothers, go to your sisters, go. I feel like I'm in that place right now. Like Mary, I want to cling to what is familiar. And I really wish I could turn back the clock, back to the time before March 17th, back before we had to go into lockdown. I wish I could go back to worshiping in the sanctuary together with all of you and shake your hands and hug you as you arrive for worship and share the peace of God with a handshake and look at you as we share Holy Communion and then sit with you at a table afterwards for fellowship and listen as you tell jokes. I wish we could go back. I think we all wish that. And so we spend a lot of precious time and energy figuring out how we can get some of our old life back at least partially, at least a few bits and pieces. We spend a lot of time talking how we can reopen the church and what procedures we need and what safety measures and when are we finally going to do this? In August? In September? But all of our dates are moving targets because no one can predict how long we will have to live with the threat of the virus. If you had asked me back in March how long the lockdown would last, back then I would have said, oh, it will last a few weeks, maybe a couple of months. Remember, our president even wanted us to reopen for Easter and then for Pentecost. And all this time, it feels like we have been spinning our wheels, stuck in wishful thinking, holding on to the dream of getting back. 
And while I cannot speak for you, I can speak for myself and say that I have wasted precious energy on my wishful thinking, energy that I could have used moving forward and exploring options of the future. The instructions of Jesus are simple and clear. Go to your brothers. Go to your brothers and sisters. The recent Christ is to be found in community, in the community of the faithful, but also in our neighbors and in the stranger, and especially in the least and the littlest and the last. Right now, it is difficult to know what the future will bring. But we do know something about God's design for our future. And God's design is about caring for each other, building community. The early Christians were very good at this, at building community. Community building was at the heart of their ministry and they formed house churches and created meal distribution systems and networks of care. Last Sunday, some of us celebrated communion together. We did it, of course, by Zoom. And we did it in the style of a house church where I sat at my living room table and the other worshipers sat at their tables. And together in this way, we broke bread and shared wine. In preparation for this communion service, I studied the ways in which the early church celebrated communion. And I found a very interesting instruction in a book called Didache. And the Didache is the teaching of the apostles. And it was written in the year 200. The Didache contains one of the earliest records of communion in the Christian church. And what surprised me was how simple it was, how simple the liturgy was. There was a simple blessing of the bread and wine. And then at the center of the liturgy was the following prayer. As this broken bread was scattered upon the mountains and then gathered together and became one bread, so may your church be gathered together from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. This idea of being scattered out into the world and then gathered back together in communion and community, this idea has been so precious to me all week long. I think that is our most urgent task right now, to bring all the broken and isolated pieces of ourselves back into community. And also to bring all people together across the conflicts that divide us and to build community and support community and invest in community. Communities that are made up of diverse groups of people of all ages and races genders and backgrounds and persuasions. That is where all of our energy should go right now. We need to go to our brothers, to our sisters, just as Jesus said. But of course, going to our brothers, to our sisters is a challenge right now because we have to keep social distance. We cannot meet in person. But that means that community building is now more important than ever. I looked up some statistics. Before the pandemic, about half of all American adults said that they are lonely some or all of the time. But now with the required social distancing, this number has risen sharply and it is not healthy. Social interaction is essential for human health. We need to be in community in order to be healthy, emotionally and spiritually. And so we need to figure out how to make community happen. 
first we need to figure it out for ourselves, but even more so for the sake of those who feel lonely, isolated, broken, scattered on the mountains. We have to figure out what we can do with the tools that we have, because we have beautiful tools. We have prayers, we have liturgies, we have technology to connect us. And so we can create prayer circles and house churches and faith and life group gatherings. We can mobilize for political action. We can use our networks. There's so much we have not yet explored, but we won't figure it out if we spend all our energy looking backward. So what can we do for ourselves? And what can we do for the world around us? How can we support our neighbors right now? How can we support small businesses that are struggling? How can we support the arts, musicians, opera singers? How can we support a vibrant city life? How can we support schools and daycare centers and universities? We can and we must figure these things out together. And we can figure it out if we call forth the resources we have. And we have wonderful resources among us. Old people are a great resource because often they have experience of picking up pieces again and starting again from scratch after a previous life has collapsed. A divorce or the loss of a life partner a loss of work or a disaster may have forced us to start over. And perhaps it was difficult at first, but we lived through it and we came out stronger. And young people are a great resource because they are often open-minded and ready to embrace new ways of doing things and new technologies. Immigrants are a great resource because many times they bring resilience. They bring the resilience of their life struggle. My wife is a very resilient person, and I think it has to do with the fact that she grew up in Russia and lived through perestroika. And children are such a gift and a blessing. They give us hope and laughter and a reason to invest in the future. So as long as we have each other and treasure each other, we have many resources to figure a way forward. And now all we have to do is reach out, reach out to each other and connect. Go to our brothers and sisters and build strong and resilient communities. Do not hold on to me, the recent Christ said to Mary Magdalene. Do not hold on to me. Go to your brothers, bring them the good news. May you be blessed on this Sunday of the Feast of Mary Magdalene. Amen.